This week, Head's role in the Jackson County appraisal mess. Plus, UMKC makes a big announcement over plans to move its marquee arts programs downtown. The saga over the future of Sprint finally comes to an end. Also this half hour, Governor Nixon's plane in tailspin after state audit. And the Metro's ghost malls, the changing face of retail in Kansas City. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and we're delighted to have you with us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, dissecting the news this week. Kansas City Star development reporter and columnist Kevin Collison. To boost our understanding of the large number of economics-related stories on our program this week, we're bringing in the big guns this week with economist Chris Keel of Amada Corporate Intelligence. Also with us, Stacey Cameron, chief investigative reporter for KCTV5 News, and reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. Now, one of Kansas City's longest-running sagas comes to an end this week as shareholders of hometown Sprint give the thumbs-up to a merger deal with one of Japan's largest cell phone companies, SoftBank. The $21.6 billion deal gives SoftBank a 78% ownership over the Overland Park-based company and finally puts to an end a rival bid by satellite company Dish. But what does this mean for Kansas City, Kevin Collison? Everybody who I talked to said this is probably the best possible outcome for Sprint and that you've got a major foreign owner that will be investing a lot of capital in the company so it can beef up its competitive stance with Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile and basically leave at least what people believe the staff and the, and the offices and the facility in Overland Park intact. It, 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 people said that this was definitely a good outcome for the company. Uh, as far as, uh, as the choices they had. Chris Keel, we're all about connecting the dots on this program, but if I, do not work for, if I do not work for Sprint, I don't own a Sprint telephone, why on earth should I care about this? Masayoshi's son is one of the more spectacular businessmen in the world. He is one of the more exciting. He has the records in Japan for losing the most amount of money by an individual in the history of the country, $70 billion, which he then made back. He is very aggressive, very creative. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that will come out of this because he's not done. SoftBank is a merger machine. They have done over 118 mergers and acquisitions in the last 15 years. So now with Sprint on board, he's got his eyes on other things. Uh, some of the companies that were trying to buy Sprint are actually now targets. And so it's, it's going to be a, quite a wild ride. We have not seen anything like this in the Kansas City area for a really long time. Stacy. Well, and one of the reasons why we might care here locally, even if you're not a, a subscriber to Sprint, is the job issue. 7,600 jobs down in uh, Johnson County, as well as in Missouri. They're the second largest employer. So the concern was, had they been bought out by DISH in a, in a hostile takeover, that a lot of those jobs may have gone away. I don't think all those jobs are necessarily safe because remember, Dish had a competitive bid which drove the price up, meaning SoftBank now is not able to put as much money into Sprint as they once had to to do things like developing their network and retaining customers and growing their customer base. They say there are savings to be found so that that money can still go into Sprint, but when corporations say they've saved money or they're going to save money, how do they tend to do that? They cut jobs. and so. I think it is the best case scenario. We may not lose a lot of jobs, but I think in the long term, we probably do see some jobs go away, but Sprint probably still stays the second you, largest you, you employer. You just mentioned it's the second largest employer. You know, for so long, it used to be on this program, you know, we started with Kansas City's largest private employer, Sprint. It has changed. I mean, it has now Cerner, and uh, in some reports, we have uh, HCA Midwest, the healthcare company, sometimes in some surveys showing that they have even more jobs than Sprint. You know, Sprint has shrunk down, and other companies have become much larger. I, I just wanted to add one thing to Stacy is that the also the philanthropic presence of Sprint will hopefully remain with the CEO and all the other top officials here and in a little bit of a connection to something we're going to talk about in a few minutes uh, there was a representative from the Sprint Foundation at the announcement about the UMKC funding which again shows you what an important role having a powerful corporation like that that donates a lot of money to the community Dave. is. Dave. Yeah, at the same time the Cerner uh, reference that you made Nick is very important because 
Cerner has a position in this community, but also nationwide, as a leading provider of the digital services it provides in the healthcare industry. Sprint is not in that position. As Stacy points out and others, they're in an extraordinarily rapidly changing industry in which the technology turns over, it seems like, every 12 months or so. So while we've all been paying attention to the SoftBank story, the real test will be whether SoftBank and Sprint together can invest enough money to once again move it to a position in which it's competitive with Verizon and other providers. If it isn't, and there's a real question as to whether this nation can put up with three or four independent uh, cell phone uh, providers, then I think Sprint long-term may be in trouble even with SoftBank's help. And that's really the story we need to focus on in the is years Is that ahead. the case, Chris? I think SoftBank is a very aggressive company. Uh, when it comes to whether or not they're going to keep jobs or add jobs, their tradition has been to add jobs rather than cut them. Uh, that's one of the things that he's been criticized for in the past, is that he's a little more generous than the average corporate holder. But he also has the attitude that if you don't beef up your resources and you don't have the material and the people to help you, you don't grow. Which was one of the concerns, though, about the DISH bid, Very wasn't much. it? That that would Very have much. led to more job losses. Dish, DISH would have cost lots of jobs. Yes. And I've Kevin. heard, you know, uh, that it's going to be ending up more like the auto industry in the United States. You're going to have the big three and possibly a fourth. I, I have not. I mean, I, it sounds like from what people tell me that when the dust settles, we're going to have at least three strong cell phone companies competing with one another. And this certainly helps boost Sprint's opportunities to be one of the last men standing in this whole deal. And be aware that SoftBank is into a lot of things other than cell phones. And the Sprint technology is going to be wrapped into a lot of other things other than just their core market. Like what? You've got a company that's heavily involved in gaming. You have a company that's heavily involved in the internet provision within Japan. You've got a company that's trying to be on the cutting edge of anything that has to do with technology. This man made his fortune selling Pac-Mans into California as a student. So you heard it here first. Get ready for more casinos right here in our metro. Okay. It's gotten so big, the man in charge of appraisals has resigned. About a month ago on this program, we examined problems with thousands of property appraisal notices going out in Jackson County. That's when some homeowners were being, seeing appraisals five times as high as last year's. Now an independent consultant hired to fix the mess finds the problem is three times worse than previously announced. Instead of 18,000 residential properties with suspect valuations, there are shortcomings in the data. For most of the 68,000 single-family homes, duplexes, and condos that were assessed, how could things have gone so terribly wrong, Dave Helling? Well, uh, no one knows precisely for sure, Nick. Uh, there were warnings early in this process that some of the data were potentially corrupt, and I think that's one of the things we're all watching to see how high up it went and how many people knew going in and who bears responsibility for this. We, we should keep in mind that appraising property is an extraordinarily complicated uh, challenge for any uh, community, let alone Jackson County, particularly in the, in the housing market in which we live where uh, prices have risen and dropped and the, the, the market is not uh, you know, smooth and predictable. So there's a certain uh, expectation that you would have a bit of a problem. This, of course, exceeds that. Heads are rolling, accusations are being made, and, and uh, the fix is being uh, pursued. We'll put but it to, that way. But to blame the Jackson County assessor, is, is, he, is he really the man to blame? Well, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah, because that's his job. I mean, you have to blame the assessor if the assessments are wrong. But it may not be just that office's problem. It may be why. Kevin, you know, what's interesting is this is a chronic problem. It's been going on for a long time. I mean, this is not the first uh, assessor in Jackson County who stumbled badly on what is a basic function of, of county government. In fact, some people would say it's one of the only major functions of county government. So I'd be curious, and I'd love to hear what Dave or anybody else thinks. I mean, is any of this going to smear onto? Uh, County uh, Executive Sanders. Well, that's the, uh, that's you know. the question, of course, and and, and uh, I think he's moving to try and tamp down the the uh, concern about it, but whether he gets there or not is another Well, question. in the video we just saw that was come from Channel 41, he seemed to be at a quite a bit of a distance <laughs> uh, from the of assessor course. in the video that we saw. And that's probably because Tyler Technologies was the consulting firm brought in by Curtis Coons to help go through this process. And two months before these notices went out, these faulty notices, the consulting company warned them that there was a problem with the system. Now. Curtis Coons, as he resigned, says there was some problem with communicating with the politicals up the chain. So 
I'm going to think that it was probably something to do with problems in the system, yet those notices still go out. So the question becomes, who knew what and how soon did they know it? So I don't think this ends up with Coons being the last one to fall on the sword. Look, he's the one falling on the sword because his, you know, ultimately, I guess it's his responsibility. But there is some indication that people higher up the food chain knew that there was a problem, but they still rushed these faulty notices out. And the question's why? Because I think they wanted to get that money in the coffers and make it more difficult for people to maybe pull back that money. This could be a huge scandal. Chris? And this is a nationwide issue. There are hundreds and hundreds of cities that are going through this exact same thing. Because what you're dealing with is data that's based on a collapsed mortgage market. And we all know what happened in 2008 and 2009. Almost all the data that we were dealing with during that boom was inaccurate. And the banks were not providing accurate information. The cities were not providing accurate information. We all know the drill in computer ease, garbage in, garbage out. And that's what we're dealing with. Nobody, today. though, has received such bad publicity, though, in our metropolitan area as Jackson County. Well, right, for years, as Stacy points right. out. Now, let me also suggest, and this isn't, hasn't been widely covered, but for all of the mistaken notices, there could be instances in which property owners found their values to drop dramatically. It isn't just always on the upside. I was doing some work on a story this week and found a home in Jackson County appraised for five straight years at around $750,000. Miraculously, in 2013, it's appraised at $450,000. So, so th that suggests there are bumps in both directions that may take some time to sort out as a macro uh, uh, ex uh, fact the revenue may not change for each individual homeowner or business owner a lot is at stake and that's why you're seeing all the political pushback and just a little theory i don't know this reminds me an awful lot of what happened in kansas last year when they went to a much more electronic way of processing motor vehicles and all the rest of it you had a total meltdown which makes you kind of wonder again how quickly we are starting to shift away from human beings going out and actually appraising a place to relying more on computer programming that may or may not be uh, as efficient as consultants tell government people when they sign these big contracts to install these systems. This week, a big announcement over UMKC's plans to move its marquee arts programs downtown. I am pleased to announce to you today that the Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation has committed a $20 million leadership grant to UMKC's Conservatory of Music and Dance towards the Downtown Campus for the Arts project. Philanthropist Julia Irene Kaufman announcing the $20 million challenge grant that she hopes would jumpstart what would be a $90 million project to move the UMKC Conservatory of Music and Dance downtown. That's $70 million more, though, to raise. Where's that money coming from, Kevin? Well, the state of Missouri, uh, two years ago, the legislature approved legislation that authorized matching funds for a university building, which this would be. Uh, so really, the nut that they have to get is 20 to 25 million in private funding. That is, of course, if the state of Missouri follows through on their promise. They didn't allocate any money for this. Uh, a lot of people thought Julia, you know, they needed a major donor to break the ice. And Julia stepped up. Uh, which she did famously for the Performing Arts Center. And this does have a lot of uh, symbiotic benefit to both facilities. So the hope is now that Julia has said, here's the first 20 million, that some of the other major donors in our community will say, okay, it's gotten the stamp of approval, it's worth me investing in. And, uh, and the folks at UMKC say they've had some serious conversations with potential donors uh, who are going back to their, quote, boardrooms to get authorization to go ahead. Nothing on the magnitude of what Julia did, but certainly this project needed a patron, and as she did with the Performing Arts Center, she's come through aided, and she's the first to admit this with the incredible resources that she inherited from her, uh, from Ewing Kaufman and, and, uh, and that whole uh, legacy. This is one of the big five ideas of the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. This is one of their big ideas that they wanted to have. Yes, this would move downtown, but why would this benefit downtown? Well, I think the, the I think one of the reasons Julia Irene Kaufman is interested is because she wants to see the continued growth of the Performing Arts Center, and the and the argument, of course, would be if you move music education downtown, that it would give more use to the center and really create more of an arts community, which I think has been argued about in this in this area for decades. Uh, you know, it, it is moving it a little bit away from the Art Institute and some of the other non-performing arts centers in Kansas City, so. 
and, and you always do sort of wonder, Nick, whether anyone ever sits in a room and says, where's the best place for all of this stuff to go? We do tend to move around a little bit in Kansas City. But there's obviously, she obviously, I think, wants to boost the potential for success at the Performing Arts Center, which is really her signature accomplishment. Uh, some people have compared it, and I'm sorry, Steve, no. uh, to uh, how the Juilliard School uh, has developed a, a relationship with Lincoln Center where you bring in these great students that you have this wonderful facility it brings in better faculty it brings in better students uh, and again you bring six or seven hundred people into an area around the Performing Arts Center they're also talking about student housing as part of this whole thing it adds a, a vibrancy that the uh, you know the star being right in the middle of the crossroads area I can attest firsthand that it definitely could use a little bit more liveliness during the daytime <laughs> uh, and uh, you know it it certainly just brings more energy to downtown the, the new SoftBank casino could also do that <laughs> Stacy but really other than the students coming there in the in the synergy with the Performing Arts Center itself, I don't know that it does benefit that area of the city a whole lot. I mean, we're talking about a niche market, so are you saying that there are going to be more coffee shops? Are yeah. you saying there are going to be more restaurants? Do you say it's going to bring more traffic into that area? Other than students, I don't know that it is. And I haven't seen anyone saying that that is something that's going to do, other than incubating the arts, but I don't know that the arts bring a whole lot of economic impact to the city. How about from an economics point of view, Chris Keel? Yeah, generally speaking, there are three things that will drive development in an urban area. There's sports, and we've talked a lot about a downtown stadium that we shouldn't go anywhere. There's the arts, and then there's some kind of a business hub. We've tried the business hub. We're not really going to have a lot of movement of the large corporations to that downtown location. Sports, again, we've kind of passed on, so I think we're, we're dealing with number three. It can be a very dynamic development for a city, but it has to be large. If you have it broken up the way it is in Kansas City, you don't get that, that concentration of activity that Stacy was referring to. You've really got to have a critical well, mass. Very quickly, it, it, it may bring coffee shops and restaurants, but it may take them away mm -hmm. from the place where the uh, conservatory is now. I mean, it may be a zero-sum game, and I think that's what some people in Kansas City. I was also surprised, about. Kevin. Yeah. They also didn't announce the actual location. Well, they've the got two locations that they've. The one is directly to the east, which, by the way, Julia owns a good two thirds of that. It's okay. a nice green field. This, and then also to the uh, south, which actually another great patron of the arts, Ju um, uh, Shirley Helsberg, owns a lot of those properties. A lot of friendly owners around there, but both locations are right next to the Performing Arts Center. And I beg to differ with these guys. I do think that it will bring more energy, more activity. What needs to happen, though, is the city, I think, needs to be a bit more proactive about encouraging this, uh, both with uh, incentives and also with zoning. Uh, well, the mayor uh, was also at that press right. conference. Well, and, and I think there's the hitch for Kansas City taxpayers like me. The mayor said that the city would do whatever is reasonably yeah. possible to help. What yes. does that mean? How uh, much traffic we... cones mm -hmm. to protect no. certain no, people coming it, it, in there? No, it's money. And it's what this city likes to do. We like to spend money on new shiny things, and then the taxpayers generally get no uh, reap no benefit. Just just look at 18th and Vine. Just look yes. at the crossroads area. Just look at the Power and Light District. We spend out millions of dollars and get very little in return. So I, I think before this goes forward, I'd like to hear a, a greater assessment. What type of output is the city going to do yes. into this? Infrastructure, tax incentives, and just simply cash that's going to help this move uh, along. There are some influential backers who are still concerned about what this does for the UMKC campus and, they and whether this dilutes mm -hmm. uh, that institutional campus setting. And, and they tried to address that in the press conference, talking about how the fact is that, you know, First, the facility of the conservatory on the campus is overcrowded, and secondly, other departments of the university could certainly fill in that space. Okay. One quick thing on the city front, though, and the mayor did bring this up, that, uh, you know, the streetcar line that's starting up uh, supposedly this summer could be extended out to UMKC, which would be a great way to link the campus and bring those students back and forth. Bannister Mall in South Kansas City was closed in 2007 and demolished in 2009. Four years later, it remains a flattened weed-filled lot. Now, the second largest mall in our metro when it was built, Metro North Mall, is barely hanging on for life. But developers are hoping to avoid Bannister Mall's fate. They have now proposed to demolish the mall on Northwest Barry Road, north of the river, and rebuild a brand new... $200 million mall on the very same site. Now, why would they want to do that when the current mall isn't working? 
Well, the demographics up there are terrific. I mean, the Northland is the fastest growing area in the community as far as homes being built and people moving there. It, it's even faster growing than Southern Johnson County. Uh, the problem is the model of the old and closed shopping center that uh, I hate to date myself that was so new and cool when I was a kid uh, is just not how shoppers want to do it. And also Metro North got hammered when Zona Rosa opened up, which is the new cool thing, the open air. Which is of, not that far away. Which is not far, and they lured a lot of tenants away. And so the idea is uh, we got the population base, we got the demographics, but we've got this obsolete Model T of a shopping complex. Let's bring a, a new version in. And I think the bodies and everything and I'm, I, are, are there to support it. So pe people don't like enclosed shopping centers anymore, Chris Keel? Well, they don't necessarily dislike enclosed shopping centers, but they really want a destination. They want an IKEA. They want an REI. They want something that is unique and compelling and is actually entertaining in its own right. The challenge with a lot of the old style malls is they expected people to come and shop. People don't go and shop now. It is entertainment. They want a Mall of the Americas experience from outside Minneapolis. They are wanting something that substitutes for going to the movies, going out and playing golf. It's supposed to be fun and places like Metro North and Bannister weren't fun. The other big challenge we're going to have to deal with is that people shop on the internet much, much yeah. more aggressively than they used to. And a lot of those people that might have run to the mall in the past just to get a few items are like, why should I drive? I'll just order my underwear online. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is when you hear a line like, we want to tear down the mall and put something in its place, we have some experience with that in, in the Kansas City area. And the first part is easy. They tore down the Mission Mall. They tore down the Bannister Mall. The second phase, building something in its place, has been much more problematic, and that may turn out to be the case here. No, well. I don't want to go through your personal life, Stacey, but you're not the kind of man who would order your underwear online. You like to go <laughs> and like support to, local right. retailers, <laughs> don't no, that, you? That's absolutely right. You know, my boxers will, will tell that story, yes. uh, of course. But And here comes the problem with, with the mall there. I, I think Chris is right. It has to be some type of destination. There is some type of entertainment. And, and the developers here are saying in the management company now that this isn't going to be your grandmother's mall. And so the real core problem with them right now is who's the second anchor tenant. We have Macy's up there now, but who are they going to bring in? You know, I, I could see maybe a Trader Joe's going up there or maybe an REI, something like that. Something that, that shoppers in the north part of the city or downtown have to go clear to Johnson County for. That's going to be difficult. There's also some aspect of there's going to be some public financing that's going to need to go here. They're talking about some beautification issues, sidewalks, uh, signage, uh, other thing, uh, vegetation and stuff. And that's going to put the city once again on the hook. Some estimates are as high as $4 million to do that. So, Because uh, this is still in the boundaries of Kansas City, Absolutely. Missouri. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, so Kansas City taxpayers are going to be once again on the hook for something yeah. new in Kansas City. I, you know... Again, and you brought this up with the crossroads. I mean, again, when you think tax incentives are not cash coming out of City Hall. Tax incentives are new value that's being created when something that is falling apart and is giving no productive value to the city gets reinvested in, and some of that gets plowed back into it. It's not a net loss. And the one other thing I was going to mention is the other store that I keep hearing that would be a great fit up there is Von Mauer. But this city is But there's already one of those at 135th. In, which is a long ways but, from... But you, do, you don't put two of those in the same market. Let me just bring up another, because as we're talking about malls, let's turn our attention to Bannister Mall for a right. moment in South Kansas City. Uh, uh, demolished in 2009, as I mentioned. It's now just a flattened weed-filled lot. It was the hoped-for site of sporting Kansas City stadium before they jumped the state line in Wyandotte County. What is the future for Bannister Mall? Is there an answer to that? There, well, you know, the buzz very much going on these days is Cerner owns a lot of that property. Cerner has hopes, I think, to develop an office campus as Cerner continues to grow. That's, that's the latest that is floating around out there. The retail idea just flopped miserably or else there would have been sporting Kansas City Stadium there. And this gets back into what Chris says. Uh, you know, you've got to have a destination, which of course they'd hope to do with the stadium there, and you've also got to have demographics. The Northland has a growing demographic. The area around the Bannister Mall, unfortunately, has been in decline for quite some time, and uh, it's just really hampered the ability. And we are, many people will say, oversaturated in this market when it comes to retail. So you really do have to invent a better mousetrap if you're going to get shoppers to show up to your place or have a lot more bodies moving and in. And the big is challenge on. is that we used to draw from about a five-state area. We mm -hmm. don't now. Uh, we have some serious competition in Wichita, Omaha, 
Des Moines. People don't necessarily have to come to Kansas City for those experiences now. And I think a lot of the developers are still living in that period where they assumed that they would draw from a three or four hundred mile radius. They don't now. Okay. As we move on on Week in Review this week, Missouri's new more than $5 million airplane used by Governor Jay Nixon was a wasteful purchase, according to a new state audit. The King Air 250 is not a justified government purchase, according to the state auditor's office, which has just released a report on the highway patrol. The state already owns five passenger planes, which were already underutilized, says the state auditor. And the Missouri State Highway Patrol did not do a formal written analysis before purchasing the new aircraft last December. The governor has already taken some heat over this. So are they going to sell the plane now, Dave Helling? No, 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 You've no, written the, the story on no, this. No, the highway patrol wrote back to the auditor and said, no, we need this airplane. Uh, we needed a new airplane. Even though the other five plane airplanes weren't being used? You know, one, uh, if you read the audit, it's kind of a chuckle. Uh, the state of Missouri owns 23 aircraft, five airplanes, a couple of hot air balloons. Did you know that, Nick? The state <laughs> owns hot air balloons <laughs> for its lottery commission and some helicopters That's and great. some other things. This is very political. Tom Schweik is a Republican. He was trying to make a point against the Democratic governor. That's part of what's behind this audit that was released. All right. Part of the motivation for that plane is business development because we don't realize how much we depend on avionics and the construction of aircraft parts. And so one of the very strong lobbies in the state is trying to protect a seriously declining private aircraft industry. All right. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from KCTV5, Stacey Cameron, and star development reporter Kevin Collison, star reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling, and economist Chris Keel, who beyond making celebrity media appearances, <laughs> is a managing director of Amada Corporate Intelligence. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.